Thank, thanks very much, and thank you all three. Now it's question time. So if everybody could find their places here, uh, the floor is now open. And perhaps first of all, I should ask, do any of you have questions or comments to each other? I certainly do, but I'll wait. Jürgen? Uh, yeah. Are these all? Yeah. yeah. I, I just thought it was striking how both of you in very different ways pointed to the encounters of Europeans going to other parts of the world and how sort of without um, yeah, or alluded to the, the challenges that poses for how we think about the encounters taking place here. And I think that's, it is really necessary to, to reconsider multiculturalism, not just by looking at what's happening here and how that's changing, but also seeing different types of encounters in different settings. And again, there's you know, one, um, one aspect of the current very high levels of immigration to Norway that I didn't point out was that most of it now is, is European. Seven of the ten largest immigrant flows are from other European countries. And the, um, the biggest European one is five times bigger than the biggest non-European. And yet, many of them are from outside of Scandinavia. So we're, that's also another type of encounter that, again, challenges this Typical encounter that immediately comes to mind when we think about multiculturalism. Yes, it's about somebody from another part of the world, probably Muslim, coming here, trying to find their way into our society. But moving away from that stereotypical view to consider other types of encounters seems to be what one might explore onwards from your presentations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, um, I'm thankful to Pankaj for showing up the incompleteness of my um, slightly flippant remark that the, the, about the immigrant, the myth, the myth of going back. And actually, what we have found out just now is that people do go back. And then from a position of having gone back, they find themselves in this extraordinary position of regarding the people they've left behind. And I don't know whether you use the word back home advisedly or not, but you were referring to Britain, back home in Britain you've left people behind. It's almost as if that they're, they're almost hostages and that they're in a position of, of being physically, physically menaced. Whereas the standard majority narrative is that the white majority are actually physically under threat. So you have this potentially what seems to be quite a dangerous double paranoia. We are both physically under threat and that's where violence comes along. Um, the other thing, I, I'm interested in is we, we've heard about people um, from the majority populations declaring multiculturalism to be um, either redundant or no longer applicable. Um, the idea that, um, that we in our uh, inestimable benevolence should have offered home, job, um, welfare, um, liberal values to people who actually reject some of these values and are actually um, discomforted by some of them and for that reason would have reasons of their own in order to reject multiculturalism is another, is another side to the argument that, that we, should, we should bear in mind. Mm -hmm. I think especially in the making of foreign policy, I mean, I was very struck by um, uh, in 2003 in the run up to the Iraq war, uh, the um, number of Pakistani Muslims I met who felt completely disenfranchised. Of course, a lot of people across Europe felt disenfranchised by the decision to back the United States, uh, particularly in, in, in Britain, a lot of non-Muslims felt, felt that way. But I think uh, they were particularly anguished that uh, their uh, beliefs were not being taken into account at all. Um, and also the, the, the war, in, uh, war in Afghanistan. And I think since then, we've seen, uh, and in my own um, uh, discussions with British diplomats, it's become clear that that uh, factor, which was neglected, was completely ignored, in fact, by people like Tony Blair, has become more important to British policymakers 
that we have this very large um, population which has these reference points back mm -hmm. in Pakistan, back in Afghanistan, quite a few of them are Pashtuns. If not Pashtuns, then Punjabis married into Pashtun families. And I think we have to take their opinions into consideration when we make, when we honor these special relationships across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, again, I mean, this is, this is, this is again, uh, Expanding the notion of connectedness is, is when we make policy in these European nation states, mm -hmm. what parts of the population are we taking, are we considering, are we considering their opinions um, at all, and, and what will be the consequences of that? Uh -huh. Yes, it's uh, it's older, isn't it? I mean, how in a country like Norway, uh, there is there is this concern with uh, contributing, as it were, to the well-being of people in other parts of the world through development aid and so on. And one of the countries in which Norway has projects is uh, Somalia. Now, one of the countries uh, from where, from where many of the migrants in Norway come is Somalia. I mean, about ten thousand, I think. Wouldn't that be the case, Jürgen? And the unemployment rates are very high, and they're considered, you know, the lowest of the low, as it were. Uh, unemployable men, um, uh, oppressed women. Uh, etc. And why is it that the Norwegian state is incapable of drawing on their bicultural resource in, in devices if, if effective aid in, in Somalia? It's quite inexplicable, but it is to do probably with the intricacies of bureaucracy, but probably something else as well, which is less pleasant. But let's have a question from the, from the audience, uh, the, the gentleman over there, please. Could you walk up to the microphone there so that everyone can hear you? Good day. My name is Jakub Sese. Um, many thanks for your presentation. I'd like to know what, is, what role does history play in the life of those migrants? How do, do, I mean, how do they reinvent, reinvent the narratives? I mean, for instance, the Pakistanis in, uh, in England. Well, it's obviously uh, at a very basic level, this is a history that is being taught in school. Uh, to them, uh, obviously, distorted version, distorted by the needs of imperatives of local nationalism. But at some stage, I mean, in the last 20 years, we've had a revolution in communications. Um, and I think we, again, the way in which political consciousness is now being um, determined, being shaped by you know, people we have not heard of on, in our own little cultural spheres, um, but uh, the, the authority of the local mullah, for instance, who might be imparting a few history lessons, has now been uh, supplanted by any number of uh, preachers on, on television, any number of TV evangelists, um, any number of satellite TV uh, uh, celebrities. And I think we have a very poor idea of how uh, political ideas, uh, political consciousness is being shaped by these uh, forces of globalization. Um, and I think uh, when you talk to, um, as talking to them, I just realized that there was a whole subculture of, uh, of, of certainly news and information and analysis that had bypassed, uh, in fact, all the official uh, sources of you know, inculcating history or in, uh, official ways of inculcating history. Um, so it's, it's becoming more and more, more and more complicated, I think, to, to, to very unsatisfactorily answer your question. Hmm. Right, well, Jürgen, yes? Actually, just, I don't know, I think the, I mean, I, I show the cartoon illustrating the ambivalence of migrants towards their countries of origin, but I think it's really, uh, ambivalence is a key word when we consider the attitudes of people elsewhere who are contemplating migration towards Europe. And I think you both alluded to that in different ways as well, how Europe can represent the admirable and the repulsive at, at the same time, and that that's influencing how people relate to Europe. And also that, I mean, the, the degree of like, post-colonial consciousness and so on is, is extremely variable um, by class and by other <laughs> factors. So yes, that political element is central to some people, but how that permeates local communities and so on will, will vary enormously. Hmm. Right. Well, we'll have another question. Yes, please. Could you also walk over to the microphone, please? <coughs> This is a question for your own calling about the immigration statistics that uh, you just showed. Um, I was wondering uh, if you have uh, any numbers uh, for how many of the uh, people you were counting 
are actually uh, going to settle. I know that in uh, the case of Denmark, recent figures have shown that 50% uh, of the people who came between 2002 and uh, the end of last year actually left again. And um, of the uh, somewhat uh, high rates of uh, all immigration that you showed, uh, which in Sweden I believe is 15% and here is 13%, half of that migration is now labor migration as well as um, uh, primarily non-Western migration. And therefore, the, the, the part of the the, the uh, silos you showed are not really re so relevant for the debates that we have here today because this debate is really about uh, the accommodation and integration of people um, living in Norway uh, who are here to settle but uh, come with uh, different cultural and uh, religious backgrounds. Isn't, isn't that right? I think they're relevant in different ways because we um, if we think about people who come here to work for a couple of years and then they leave again, then they're replaced by somebody else just at the time when they're starting to find their way into Norwegian society. So in terms of accommodating large-scale immigration, it, it can be even more difficult if there's a high turnover of constantly new people. And what we're seeing is that now actually quite a lot of people are in Norway on on a temporary basis. And we can't just ignore them. We have, to, we have to consider them as part of society as well. And they obviously represent very different challenges from, from people who might come from a, sort of a, a more culturally distant origin, but, but come with the idea of staying longer. Mm -hmm. But we, we're actually now just in the middle of a, a big research project on return migration, where this is one of the things we're looking at. And 60% of, of immigrants in Norway are open to the idea of returning to their country of origin. And yes. we know that many, uh, only a fraction of them will actually do it. But just, just the fact that so many are open to that possibility, say either yes, I will do it, or I don't know, uh, also says something about the, the um, challenges of a society where many people sort of keep the door open um, and might be weighing back and forth in terms of how does their integration efforts uh, pay off, how are they received, what are the options in terms of um, returning to the country of origin and starting again there. You know, in the afternoon of the 22nd of July, after the blast in the center of Oslo, but before we heard about the shootings at Utøya, when nearly everybody, well, most people, I think, most people I spoke to had the suspicion that Muslim terrorists were behind. Uh, many Norwegian Muslims were already beginning to pack their bags. And even after it would transpire that it was a Norwegian terrorist who killed other ethnic Norwegians, but everybody knew that it was because he hated Muslim immigration that he did this. There were Muslim kids in this country who wrote letters to the editor, I mean, of newspapers and so on, saying, look, don't they want us? Do they want us to leave? Are we not welcome here? The feeling of not being welcome is fairly widespread. And if we want to understand the dynamics or the dialectics of multiculturalism to do with withdrawal, basically, if we talk about multiculturalism in the strict sense as a form of, of withdrawal, that, that part of the equation has to be taken into account. And when you spoke, especially Pankai, I was reminded of a novel by Sam Selvon, uh, um, you know, a, a, a immigrant, an immigrant from Trinidad to, to Britain in the 1950s called The, Lo the Lonely mm -hmm. Londoners, which is a brilliant novel about the immigrant experience for that first generation of black people from the Caribbean to Britain, because they had come in the expectation of being treated as, as a kind of Britons. I mean, they had British passports, they were British subjects under colonialism, and had, uh, had grown up in a British school system and so on, and discovered that they would never be treated as anything but second class citizens. And what you do then, well, you withdraw into a kind of black consciousness movement eventually. Mm -hmm. So this part, of the, this part of the equation of the dialectics of, of multiculturalism, I think, is, is important to take into account here. But the floor is still open to members of the panel and members of the audience. Yes, please. I try to hear because the way is too loud. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe someone can... Oh, no, they can't. <laughs> My name is Erhard Busseg. I'm coming from Austria. Uh, may I say, I'm coming from a country with a very low birth rate. Uh, we are dying out, but the population is growing. I think uh, we are now 8.4 million. I think as I started to be in my country, it was 6 million. This is by immigration. 
And uh, here we have the strange situation on the one side, uh, we are quite happy that all those who are coming are paying social insurance because it's a guarantee for us. On the other side, we would be very happy if they are going again home concerning your remarks uh, on Norway uh, existing here. I think the question is, how far is a reality check done? Uh, I think that we are very much depending on this and what the consequences are. Uh, here, I think, uh, by the politicians, question of uh, reality and politicians is one question. I was a politician. Uh, or the second question is, in which way uh, is uh, the impact of this really situation understood? I think because the pre-charges are running around is really crazy. I may tell you a nice one. I think the largest group immigrating now uh, to Austria are Germans from Eastern Germany. Eh? I think the argument against the immigrants was always they are not really speaking Germans. May I say the Germans coming to Austria are better speaking German than the Austrians are speaking German. But this is quite another question. What to do that a reality check is existing? Hmm. Well. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to. You're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Well, the, the thing about migration is that the, the territory changes faster than the map and that we all have stereotypical ideas about who is an immigrant and who isn't. Just as Jürgen was saying, the typical immigrant, the semantic core of the immigrant for West Europeans is the Turk. In the, in the wider sense, here it's the Pakistani, okay? But it's, a, it's, it's the old image of the Ottoman Turk at our gates, since you mentioned Austria, standing at the gates of Vienna. In Austria and the people. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Well, we all have different, and, and we used to have, in, in Sweden they had stereotypes about Finns before they had Africans and Muslims, which were quite uh, similar. So American sociologists who visited Sweden in the 1950s were shocked to see that these white and, and the blonde and, and blue-eyed people were treated the way Afri well, African Americans were treated in America. So these things shift a bit, but still, well, there is a semantic one, and it's not the Pole. Although the, although the pole are, Poles are, as you know, I mean, now by, now by far the largest immigrant group in, in, in Norway. So, uh, so map, the map is not the territory. Stereotypes are not reality. And it's, when you say immigrant, you think about the Muslim. If it's a man, it's a perpetrator. If it's a woman, it's a victim. And that's it, you know. Um, but uh, we have time for a few more questions from the audience. Or comments, or objections to the speakers. Well, I'd like, I'd like to ask Christopher a question, because it seems to me that some of the things that you spoke about uh, regarding both uh, Iran and Turkey and the relationship to, to the North Atlantic world of, of, of Wandsworth uh, is to do with uh, the urban and the rural. Uh, would you be prepared to generalize about the urban and the rural regarding complexity and views of complexity? Um. I think it would be difficult to generalize about the urban and the rural because as far as I know, the, um, it is convenient to assume that a lot of poorer immigrants into Western cities come from rural backgrounds. I believe a lot of um, convincing uh, research has been done to suggest that this is not in fact the case. A lot of them mm -hmm. come from small towns or even cities. Um, <coughs> what I, the, the, again, to return to this, to this cartoon and cartoons so often um, some things up in, in a wonderful way. The idea of whether or not the fellow, the, the, the grandfather came from a small town or from a rural part of the world, he is referring in this happiness and poverty to a community, the idea of people knowing one another, the idea of um, uh, not living in a transient um, temporary society, but living in a society where um, the people you knew as children um, grow up alongside you and, and will bury you or you will bury them. And this is something that's atavistic, it's something that um, answers to a very basic desire um, that we've all had and we all have inherited. Um, but it does seem to be um, faced by very serious challenges when you come to the urban environment, which is based entirely on the transient, especially um, in uh, strongly market-based economies. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't see a way, I don't see a way out of that, and I don't see um, a way of recreating those, those communities and at, the same time, uh, at, and at the same time allowing for the kind of connectedness that has to exist between incoming communities and the host community if this relationship and if this, um, uh, this meeting is not going to become a conflict. 
Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, one option that has been proposed, uh, I'll just throw this out and see if any of you want to take the bait, is that uh, the politicization of identity is generally a bad idea. I mean, for, for, for the obvious reasons, which have been discussed now for 20 years. But commercialization of identity can give some of the same rewards without the, without the cost. You know, commercialization, I mean, uh, do tourism rather than, uh, than the politics of identity. A harmless, aesthetic form of multiculturalism, which gives people a sense of rootedness and belonging and pride in culture without the political cost. Well, nobody wants to respond, so we'll have a final question over there. <laughs> yes, I was very struck. Can you breathe? I was struck by something that Pankaj Mishra said, which was that uh, educated Indians in, in the imperial era came, against, came up against this extraordinary complex and arcane English colonial society, which excluded them to some extent. And then, of course, they come to England and they find that it's still there and they still have the same problems of, uh, of relating to it. And, of course, in a kind of weirdly mutated way, it's still there now. That England, and I use the word England advisedly, is a sort of tortured society in the sense of the uh, survival of these archaic differences. Whereas it strikes me that Norway uh, is a society where, where there are much less important. It, is, it seems to me a genuinely more egalitarian society than England is. So there's a question as to whether this kind of egalitarianism is a positive factor in enabling immigrants to feel at home. That it's easier, perhaps, and I, I say this as a question, to be integrated in a society like Norway than it is in the south of England. Excellent question. Well, Jürgen, you're the expert. <laughs> And, and to me, Norway seems a terribly difficult country to come to. Uh, it's hard enough to, to live here, I feel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think I actually <laughs> have to come back to this idea of the, of the children of immigrants taking, up, immigrants taking up a bigger place in society, that I think gradually it will <laughs> change our notions of what our society is, is about. But there is still a sense of, I mean, there is a sense of of uh, purity, which is which is there, which I imagine exists in many other countries as well. But I mean, having Thomas mentioned that I've done much of my own uh, field research in Cape Verde, which is a you know Creole society created by migration, and it strikes me often how that the openness of a society like that was, I mean, a, a gift to me as a foreigner as well, that I would be seen as just one end of a continuum of sort of, or further off on a continuum of, of Cape Verde, and yes, rather than being abruptly outside it. And I think mm -hmm. those, I'm, I'm not sure that those sort of barriers are really any lower in, in Norway than in other. Uh, in fact, in, in some ways, it's more easy to come as an immigrant into a hierarchical society with more complementary roles, because there are lower ranks on the ladder where you can find a place. Whereas in an egalitarian uh, country like Norway, there is a conflation of similarity with equality. We're using the same word in Norwegian and Danish. Liket means both similarity and equality. In, uh, in other words, in order to become a member of society, you have to be equal, and in order to be equal, you have to be similar. So there is something here about the cultural grammar of exclusion and inclusion, which makes it a little bit awkward. But, but I always say that we're doing a lot better than one might have expected in the 1960s regarding the accommodation of diversity, because we had very little experience with it. We had experience with oppressing minorities, with not allowing Jews and Jesuits into the country, Norwegianizing the Sami in the far north, and not really being concerned with diversity, but with homogeneity as a national project. And yet, um, there is considerable diversity. There aren't riots. Most of the immigrants get to work. There's considerable, as you pointed out, Jürgen, social mobility in the second generation, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I, can I get back to your previous challenge also? Because I think we should, we should try to pick up on you, that. But the, the you may. If there are any final questions, we're now soon uh, uh, having coffee, OK? Yeah. So if there are any final questions, yes, you get the floor in a little while. About politicizing versus commercializing, I think that it's really primarily about different forms of polit politicizing identities and that we, we see 
more of the sort of not just the hardline politicizing, but also the softer politicizing, such as seeing how the how migrants can recreate their own image in an instrumental way as well. So that, for instance, um, migrants who support development initiatives in their countries of origin, as you said, is difficult perhaps to do through official channels. But when they do on a private basis, it really does something not just to their relationship with the country of origin, but also mm -hmm. with their standing within um, our societies. Absolutely. And I mean, in, in the US, there's a, a longer tradition of this, where, for instance, South, South Asians have have hired South Asian community organizations have hired consultants from the Jewish communities to mm -hmm. show them how to to promote a positive image of themselves within society. Yep, that's, that's, the, that, that's right. That's the identity game of neoliberalism. It's fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so I think the final question also attaches itself to this problematic, does it? Uh, well, in a way. Uh, sorry. Uh, my name is Tudben Reisaksen. Um, I'm a member of parliament in Norway. My, my question was, how can you not politicize identity? Mm -hmm. is there, are there any examples at all of a, of a human society where identity hasn't in some way or another been politicized? And so isn't that sort of, a, a, in a way, a very naive liberal fantasy not to have a society that in some way or another politicizes identity? Well, I'm very pleased to have a, a liberal conservative member of parliament accusing us of being <laughs> too liberal and naive. So that's a, that's, that's a first, and I enjoy that. Uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, the jury is out on this. But think about it. Think about commercialization of identities, such as the more or less sort of artificial retention of certain Norwegian customs for the benefit of Norwegian-American tourists in Gudbrand, Salen, and, and that part of, of the country. Uh, you know, where, where porridge is made in the old way, you know, where they have have cured ham, where they have serve all the traditional dishes with fiddle music and with fork dresses and so on. Uh, I don't see the fascism in that. I see, I see that as fairly harmless. As a harmless way of siphoning off emotions, just in the same way as football, since the whole, all of Europe is now concerned with who's going to win the European Cup in football, which has all the good aspects. English, aren't all the good, well, <laughs> yeah, all the good side, all the good parts of fascism are none of the bad ones. And a lot of immigrants are football players. Exactly, mm -hmm. and, they be, and they become German. Mesut Özil becomes German by virtue of being a good football player. So, so that's, a, that's a short answer, but of course, if this is a big discussion. I think it's, it's, it's useful to distinguish between the commercialization and the politicization of identity. They may look the same, but they serve different functions and they work also according to a different kind of dynamic. Um, and on, on that note, if there aren't any closing remarks from the panel? Um, I, I, I see the logic behind your question. Certainly um, when I spent two years in Eastern Turkey um, researching a book about identity, I was actually researching a book about how identity had been um, turned into an emblem or turned into a flag that could then be raised against one's foes. So naturally it, it was political. Um, so I, I can see the logic behind that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But on that note, we'll, just a moment. There's coffee now uh, downstairs in the basement, just outside and to the left, and we reconvene at 4:30. And thank you all, and thanks to the panel. <laughs>